three email strategies that uh, look like magic. <clears throat> Just quickly run through the agenda for today. So we'll do a very brief introduction um, as to why we're doing this, why we're here, who I am, for anyone who doesn't know. Then we'll get dive into the three email strategies that look like magic. Um, and then we'll finish with an AMA, <coughs> excuse me. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping stuff first. Um, there are several uh, of my colleagues, hello everyone uh, from B Digital in the chat and uh, watching as well. Um, please keep an eye out for Chris Bradford, who is our product director, who is also co-hosting this with me today. So Chris's main role will be um, keeping an eye on what's happening inside the chat. Any questions anyone has? Although there's an AMA towards the end, uh, please, 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 any questions you've got, just get them straight into the chat box so they're out of your mind and somewhere that we can see them. Chris will keep an eye on them, he'll record them. Um, and do keep an eye on things that Chris says. He'll also probably send uh, a few links and a few additional thoughts and other things to check out based on the stuff that we, uh, we talk about today. Um, so... Uh, that's uh, so why we're here why we're here look um anyone who came to our last webinar the know that we had a really great fascinating ama session at the end and there were many follow-up questions as well and the majority of the questions that were asked were about getting the most return on the uh emails and email marketing um and there were lots of questions about getting more clicks more opens and all the rest that go alongside it <clears throat> so it just seemed to be really logical to us to say well if we're getting lots of questions on email marketing let's so try and select three real high quality exciting email strategies that i personally love and that we use at digital um, that are really quite easy to implement but um really high return on investment for that um it's quite difficult to pick only three but i really like these three and i think you'll all see that there are there's reasons why I've picked each one of the three and they're used in very, very different ways. Um, so let's just start off with a brief intro for anyone who doesn't know. Um, it's my fetching picture there in top hat waistcoat. And I did forget to put on a uh, red sequin blazer that I, I do have. Um, I've got more than 13 years experience <clears throat> in marketing to schools. I'm a guest speaker on all things marketing. I'm a digital marketer certified partner and mentor. And I've helped generate many millions of pounds of, uh, of, of, of sales for education supplies with marketing that we do. You've got my details in there. You can always connect with me on LinkedIn or on, uh, on email. Everyone should have my email address as well. So please feel free at any point just to drop me an email or to reach out on LinkedIn and many other platforms. That I'm sure you'll find me on. There aren't many Brian Plums. I'm sure people are delighted to hear. Um, so <clears throat> let me just shift my microphone a little bit. And we'll get started. So um, the, <laughs> the number one email, the open loop. I Sorry, I thought, yeah. Um, open loop email. I absolutely love them. Um, bonus point if anyone tells me what the uh, movie is that we're referencing here. Open loop email. Let's just look at the purpose of this for now. So the purpose of the open loop email is to create anticipation for what is to come. <clears throat> so if this is you know, if you feel like your open rates have dipped, well done, Bruce. Um, or if you feel like when you're sending emails, you're kind of talking to nobody, you're not really getting any interaction there. Or if you feel like your emails are almost uh, isolated, like you're, you're creating one email, it's not really part of a bigger picture and you're sort of doing it because you kind of have to do it. Um, this email is for you. Again, this is not about really generating lots of interest and reactions to the email we're about to send. It is about setting the tone that the next email is going to get real high levels of engagement and uh, and interaction <clears throat> so it's one of my favorite tactics <clears throat> excuse me i do have a bit of a cough at the moment um oh looks interesting our picture has vanished and i'm not entirely sure why um that was a picture of uh, russian psychologist bloomer zigarnik i probably pronounced that incredibly uh, wrong um she's uh taking a break clearly so we want to look at the psychology first before I dive into how to use an open loop email and what it really is and how it works. We'll look at the, the, the psychology here. So Zyganek was a, uh, a Russian psychologist and uh, she was fascinated by the idea of pattern interrupts with the brain and uh, uh, identified this uh, Zyganek effect which is where uh, she states that our minds quickly forget finished tasks 
However, they are programmed to continually interrupt us with reminders of unfinished tasks. And it's these intrusions that constitute the Zeganic effect. So what this means really is um, that we remember things when there's a break, there's a pattern interrupt. We, entire complete stories, the whole thing becomes difficult to remember because there's a start, there's a middle, there's an end that was lovely and it's, it's concluded in itself. And so our brain can sort of compartmentalize that and put it away because we don't need it anymore, it's now finished with. But when there's a story that doesn't have an ending and there's a sudden stop or there's a sudden pattern interrupt, it's very hard for our brains to kind of close that off and put it aside. Um, we're constantly reminded that we don't know the end of that story. So how does this um, relate to the real world? So in practice, <coughs> excuse me, Zygonic noticed that waiters have real little difficulty in remembering orders that are open or unpaid. But once the orders are closed, they're paid, people leave, the waiters have very, very difficult, uh, a great deal of difficulty in remembering what was ordered and who ordered what. Now you may even notice this yourselves, um, if you remember the good times of you know, going into a restaurant and the like, um, and often waiters will take the order and they won't even write anything down because they have a, an ability to just remember who's ordered what, how well, how rare the steak is and all the rest of it and what order it comes from, and they can recall it. But the moment it's paid for and that table has left, it's very, very, very difficult to recall who ordered what and what happened because their brain has compartmentalized it and pushed it to the side. So this is used to great effect in Hollywood. Um, I, I know that my wife and I, when we were watching Breaking Bad, um, we completely binge watched on this. And again, I think this is something that we can probably all relate to. Um, episodic uh, TV programs and, uh, and the like, where it feels like there's no end to an episode. The very end of the episode leaves you on a cliffhanger or it's the beginning of the next episode. It's very, very hard to say, okay, great, we'll go to bed now, or we'll stop watching that and now go do something else because the story of that episode doesn't really finish. There's a break and it's introducing the next part of the, uh, of, of the show, the next episode. And me Hollywood know this and they've been doing this for, for oh, I say Hollywood, but TV production companies and so on and, uh, and screenwriters, uh, they know this and they know it really well. Um, authors know it around chapters as well. When you write a chapter and you leave a real great cliffhanger, it becomes so difficult to put down the book because you just feel like you have to read the next because you need the closure, but you never really get closure because you feel like I don't want to stop halfway through a chapter when closure actually happens because that would be weird. Um, I need to get to the end of the chapter, but the end of the chapter leaves me on another cliffhanger. So it becomes very, very hard to stop. <clears throat> that is exactly what we mean by an open loop. So how are we able to use open loops? How do we be digital use open loops and how can you guys use it? Our goal is to use storytelling to generate interest and intrigue in our future communications. Remember, that is the goal here, to use storytelling to generate interest and intrigue in our future communications. Here is an example. Now, I don't know how well you guys can read this. I'm gonna, the next slide actually breaks down the individual components of this email and why it works. This is actually a more complicated version of an open loop email than you will need, but I'm showing it you because this is actually a really exciting, clever email for, for various reasons that we'll go through in a second. If you can't read it properly, just bear with us. Um, Chris, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get the slide deck and everything over to everyone um, once we've got recordings and the like, so you will be able to see it and manipulate and do as you want with it as well. So this is the email, I'm gonna walk you through it and why it works. Firstly, the subject line. Now we're not going to talk about, there's a lot we could talk about with, uh, with subject lines, but we're not going to talk about the subject lines uh, today. However, this is a curiosity-led subject line. Pop quiz question about childhood obesity. Now this could just be a fascinating fact about childhood obesity, but it, it's a bit too obvious. So the idea of leading with a bit more curiosity is a, a pop quiz question, or, you know, you'll never guess the answer to this question. Do you know, you know, reply ABC. That kind of thing is what we're doing here. So we're encouraging the open by leading with curiosity in the subject line. Then what we need to do, and this is really important really when you want the best results on them, emails in general, frankly, but emails for an open loop is to be personal. And we've talked about this before, be personal, be personable um, and lead with a personal anecdote. So in this email it says, uh, hi Jane, a few weeks back, I was invited into my son's school. I should probably point out, I'm also a school governor to discuss plans for the sports premium fund. Cue the teas, the biscuits, and the socially distanced catch-ups. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second here. What we're trying to do here is really set the, set the scene. And it's very hard 
to read that and not visualize as a, as a teacher or someone who's been into these, these meetings, what's going on. It's very hard not to hear the, the, uh, the, 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 the clinking of the teaspoon against the, uh, against the, the mugs, hard not to hear, you know, the biscuit wrappers being opened and all the rest of it and the, 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 the quiet chatter of the people, because everybody can relate to this who it's going to. So we're trying to just set the tone, set the scene, use a little bit of storytelling with a little bit of personal insight. Oh, by the way, I'm a school governor. I should probably point that out here. I, I know what I'm talking about. Okay, we'll move on. The head teacher raised a statistic that really shocked me and I thought I should share it with you. Now look at this really bold, direct, bold question with multiple choice answers. What percentage of children in London are overweight or obese? A, 20%, B, uh, 30% or C, 40%. Now we have a real clear call to action. I'd love to know what you think. So reply to this email, A, B or C and no Googling. It's really important to note here that when we're seeing emails on desktop, it's slightly different on phones, when we're seeing emails on desktop, at first we tend to visualize it as an image. So we see this whole thing and we zoom in and see there's something, there's a question, there's a bold question with some choices. I'm intrigued. Now I go back to the top and I start reading it. So that is the pattern that people will go through. They'll look at the email, they'll see the bold thing, they'll see that there's multiple choice, they'll go to the top and they'll start reading down because it's caught them, it's intrigued them. Now get this ending in here. Again, all of what we've done there, the fact that we've got a multiple choice question in and it's not actually needed when you do this, okay? It's a really clever way of getting responses. Remember our goal here is to set an open loop and this next bit is the open loop, okay? Keep an eye on your inbox tomorrow and I'll share the answer. Plus, I'll let you in on a little secret we discovered about getting children active in the post lunchtime lull. Speak tomorrow, Simon. So all this email's doing is setting the tone, giving some interest and some intrigue, sort of edge of C. Oh, that's fascinating, but I'm going to tell you the rest tomorrow, which is really annoying, actually, because you go, well, we kind of want to know now. Um, and that's the point. We're taking an episodic approach to the email campaign. Here is a simpler version. On Monday, we'll be sharing exactly how we did it. This is a very obvious version, okay? On Monday, we'll be sharing exactly how we did it. Hi, Jane. In a few days' time, we'll be pulling back the curtain and sharing three strategies on how we helped one school to skyrocket staff and student well-being. You'll learn so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. I can't wait to share this with you, so keep an eye on your inbox on Monday. So this is a real simple but direct version of the open loop email. And when you do this, if you lead with... Uh, as long as you don't do it too often, lead with a curiosity-based and ideally a uh, personalized uh, curiosity-based subject line. So that would be, um, Jane, on Monday, I'm sharing exactly how we did this with you, something like that. Um, you're going to get more opens and you're going to need opens on this in order to uh, you know, excite people for the next one. Lead with a curiosity-based subject line on this email. Personal, uh, personal anecdote or gives, lead with storytelling, lead with trying to paint the picture and then hit them with, but I'm going to tell you tomorrow, but wait until Monday. Okay, that is our email one. So I've got some top tips for it. Firstly, think episodically. I know I've said it several times. It is, if you've never done this before, it's really, really tempting to want to tell the whole story in an email. Like, hey, I was at this thing and you will never guess what they said. And here, actually, here's the question. Do you think it's 20, 30, 40? Surprisingly, it's 40%. And, and it, by the way, it is actually 40%. 40% of Children in London are deemed as you know, overweight or obese. And I couldn't believe it. Isn't that crazy? Tune in Monday for something else. Like, no, you were so close. Like, tune in Monday for another fact. Is, 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 is Yeah, okay. But you've kind of gone, that's the end of this episode. See you next week for next week's episode. We, we, don't, we don't want to do that. We want to think more episodically, but in the sense of where one teases the next one, where one doesn't quite end the next one closes the loop and potentially opens a new loop as well. Not always, but potentially. Is this making sense to people? I just think like, a, just press like Y in the comments or something. If this is making sense to you and like, okay, this, this sort of makes sense then. Excellent, thanks guys. Um, to use storytelling and inject personality. If you're not using storytelling, if you're just being a good day, sir, and welcome, because it's the education sector and we need to be very serious. <laughs> like you just like, please stop, basically, please. Or I'll, I'll carry on um, because we, you know, our clients aren't denying and they get really good results. Um, use storytelling, inject personality into it. The whole, you're painting a picture. You want it to feel like it's a bit of a story, like it's a bit of a, you know, a, a, maybe not breaking bad, but it's it's something like that on TV that you want them to hang on till, uh, till the next episode. So finally, don't overdo it. Um, you can already annoy people with lots of open loops. It's like, oh, here we go again. 
you can really annoy people with uh, lots of curiosity-based subject lines. So the, it's always tempting to go down when you do one or two, you're like, oh my God, our, our open rates just boosted like 20%. This is the key to it. It's curiosity subject lines. It's not. Um, the key is diversification of subject lines and diversification of types of content. Sub curiosity subject lines will, will often get great open rates. Um, I'm sure the email that we probably just sent out saying, no, we'll probably will get um, great open rates. Um, actually, that's not that we did this on purpose. However, um, it's not often a bad thing if you send an email by mistake and follow it with, I'm so sorry, you shouldn't have seen that. Curiosity subject line, you're going to get opens. Uh, don't overdo it, though. People get really annoyed by it. Um, so drip the idea of, um, the, uh, of, of this first type of email. Uh, the open loops throughout campaigns that you're sending. You're going to see some real nice peaks and spikes when you do that. Again, it's not about the first email. It's about leading into the next email. That is um, email one. Email two, the reactivator. I love this, uh, the image that I uh, chose for this. Um, terrifying. And there we go. So the reactivator. Let's talk about the purpose of the reactivator. The reactivator is to reactivate leads that have gone quiet. Let me just ask a question, um, and we'll use number one for this one. Um, if you've got a list of contacts and leads, let's say, and you've got, you know, a number of them have gone cold and they've just gone quiet, just hit like one on your keyboard. Let me tell you, I'd be hitting one right now because, uh, like, basically if it's not entirely every single person on the call, you probably need to work on generating a better, uh, list. Thank you, Bruce. One, 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 one. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I mean. Like this is for everybody okay everybody if you haven't got leads that are going cold you've not got a big enough list it's that straightforward you need to be building that pipeline because i'd be worried so well, this is about reactivating those leads that have gone cold so this is a really exciting one for me and i, I absolutely love this um so if you've got prospects that never turn into trials trials that didn't turn into demo calls demo calls that didn't turn into sales etc 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 you've got a list with leads that have gone cold this is for you this little gift guy, this little meme down here. A cold lead is just a warm lead that you let go cold. All right. Let's just look at the psychology of um, the theory of reciprocity for a second. So we, if, if by the way, if you guys haven't, um, if anyone's not on our newsletter, uh, Tate, Turn Attention Into Trust, uh, Chris, please uh, pop a, a link in there, people. You, you definitely should be. Um, comes out once every couple, once every two weeks, and there's a whole bunch of my thoughts on there and uh, useful hints and tips around marketing to schools and book recommendations and podcast recommendations. Not all about marketing, um, but life and stuff in general. This is like one of the greatest books that every marketer should own. We, uh, I have two versions. I've got one here, one in the uh, the office in London. Um, everybody should get this. Everybody should read this fantastic book around um, human psychology and the, uh, well, in this instance, uh, the psychology persuasion. So I want to tap into uh, the theory of reciprocity for a second. So people by nature feel obliged to provide discounts or concessions to others if they've received favors from those same people, okay? So people by nature feel obliged to provide discounts or concessions to others if they've received favors from those same people. <clears throat> Let's look at this in practice. Um, annoyingly, this is also another waiter thing, but it's the best example of it. So we ignore the link between the two different waiters. This is another, but it's important to go. So why do you get mints with your bill when you're in a restaurant? It was noted that waiters were increasing their tips by 3% after diners were given a free mint. But they increased by 14% when a diner was given two mints. Okay, cool. Now here's a fascinating bit. If the waiter left one mint with the bill and then quickly returned and gave a second mint, the tips increased by 23% on average. Which I just find phenomenal and just, just absolutely fascinating. There are, by the way, there's loads of studies into the theory of reciprocity, but this one's the one that's sort of... Um, most intrinsically linked with the numbers and what we're about to do with it and all the rest of it. So the key thing here is person gets favor. Oh, look, there's uh, there's a sweet. Cool. I'll give it a little tip. Person gets additional favor, you know, bigger tip. Oh, I'll give a bigger tip back. If a person gains a favor and then he's basically thrust upon them, actually, here's another one. Here's another favor. It feels like an even bigger event. It's like, 
I need to do something really special to say thanks for this. So um, if anyone knows any waiters, by the way, you should probably tell them to go and do this because this kind of thing works. Um, but it, yeah, theory of reciprocity. Um, fascinating subject around uh, around sort of the concept of tips and you will have experienced this when um christmas is a great example of this if a neighbor gets you a christmas card okay and it's a neighbor you don't particularly know well but if you get a christmas card from them you suddenly feel obliged to have to get a christmas card back right and if anyone thinks it's like no you're totally wrong i don't feel this please let me know and maybe i'm just a weirdo here but you know if you get a christmas card something you don't really know you feel like oh god I've got to... all right i'll get my christmas card and get them on back now, let's say if you've got children, who's got children, if, you know, a parent of another child buys a present for your child, for instance, it's like, okay, cool, that's lovely. But now you're obliged to have to buy a present back for their birthday. And the weird thing is, this is where the 23% tip thing comes into play. It goes beyond this. It's not just that you feel like you have to also provide the gift back. You actually feel like you have to provide a gift of similar or higher value back. And the weird thing is, you know, that if I don't do that, not only will I feel weird, but the other parent will see it as being weird. And they'll know that I will feel weird because we should just do this thing because this is just what the world says. It's the unwritten rule. You get something, you give something back of similar or higher value. And this has been shown time and time and time again. There's loads of examples in the book Influence. Please go check it out. So one other psychological um, aspect I want to look at today. So that's reciprocity. Step that one aside for a moment. Humility. We need to understand human responses to humility. So humility is seen as a positive trait and has been shown to strengthen social bonds. So the, the quote on this actually, which is a great quote, um, is viewing others as humble facilitates greater commitment and promotes a sense of we-ness, togetherness. So it's weird, anyway. So viewing others as humble facilitates a greater commitment and promotes a sense of weirdness. You know, no one likes a cocky show off. We like someone who actually can say, do you know i don't know what i'm not sure what i'm doing here or actually i got this thing wrong like that's cool because it shows a human trait we need to remember reciprocity plus humility will drive action in this email okay reciprocity humility action by the way with this whole cam this whole uh, webinar is around three different strategies you'll see there's actually lots of strategies we're just framing them into three different emails. There's lots of strategies you can, you can take from here and dip into different places. Reciprocity plus humility equals action. What does this look like? Here is a reactivator email. So um, remember, we're trying to reactivate a cold list here. Let me take the next slide and just explain how this all works. Again, you will, I'll go through it and then you will get the slide deck to go through as well. So personalized curiosity subject line that leans in on humility. Jane personalized. Can I ask a very quick question? Curiosity, because, oh, weird subject line, but also leans on humility, i.e., if, if I'm asking you a question, it's because I ultimately I need help. I need help with an answer. Really brief intro. I'm Steve, founder of My EdTech Products, the only MIS company to rated five stars on EdTech Impact. Social proof. Great intro. Here's who I am, what I'm doing. Here's some proof that we're great. Okay, cool. I'm interested. Now we're gonna put some context down that leverages the theory of reciprocity. So see if you can get it and then I'll explain. You downloaded our free guide, 12 ways to win the classroom management war a few weeks back, but I noticed you hadn't booked a demo with me. I'd just love to know why. We're not saying, hey, you've not booked a demo with us. We're setting the tone and reminding them that we gave them a favor and they owe us something back. That favor is, I created this 12 ways to win the classroom management war guide and I did all the research, I created all the copy, I've got it all designed and looking lovely and I gave it to you for free. I did all these amazing things. I noticed you hadn't done the one thing that I've asked you for though. Now, if you could just click an option below, it'd be a huge help and I'd really appreciate it. Again, humility in there, it'd be a real big help and I'd really appreciate it. It was a very clear call to action and look at how low the barrier is in this call to action. I'm not saying, when are you going to speak to me? I'm not saying, do you want it? I'm saying, just click one of these options. And these call to actions would restart a conversation. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about the technology that we use here because that's a whole other ball game. But you've got three options. You've got, I am interested. I just haven't had a chance to organize a demo. You've got, I am interested, but can you message me in January? And you've got, I'm no longer interested. Based on whatever anyone was to click on there, 
something would happen, you know, um, they'd, they'd be encouraged to go and book a demo. Um, we, the, we or the client would be notified where they're at. So it just starts a conversation again, basically. If none of the above makes sense, do just reply with a brief comment. Thanks so much for your time. Just your click or reply really helps us to improve. Absolutely laced with humility, contextualized with reciprocity. So you owe me a favor and I'd be massively helpful if you did because I just need your assistance and your support with it on this. But remember, I did that thing, so you kind of owe it to me. Combine those things together, incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, Chris's point is absolutely on the money. Um, it works better the higher quality. The I mean, we've used it as a lead magnet. Um, you know, if your lead magnet is terrible, like if, you know, you download your guide, if it's terrible, like, well, great, good luck. You know, if your favor is not very good, you know, um, you're not going to get a good return back. Remember what I said earlier about if the perception of the value of the favor you gave or the presence that someone gave is high, the person feels they have to at least match or increase that. Email three, if this is all making sense, I'm happy. Okay, email three, the referral machine, as you'll see, sponsored by Xerox, the referral machine. When do we use this? Okay, the purpose for the referral machine is to scale referrals. I want us to ask a quick question again, if I can. Um, uh, I want to know if you're sending referral. E so what I mean by referral email is um, encouraging your customers to refer you to other schools, probably the best way I can put it. Um, and I want to know if you're sending emails like this out, say every month, just put a Y in the chat. And if you're, if you're not, just, just put an N. But I'd love to know, are you sending them out frequently every month? Uh, I mean, we're not, we're not doing it every month. We're not, um, but this is the thing. I, okay, so I want you just to think on, um, thanks Emma, and I really appreciate you. Like I say, guys, for me, this is always a bit of a two-way thing. I don't like this, like, you know, listen to me and I'm chatting. These things are things that we've learned. These are things that we've practiced, we've tried, we've experienced, we've done things wrong, we've done things right, and we and we put it out there. But when I'm asking questions, it's really useful to get the feedback back from you guys because that's how we understand how we can help better going forward. So I uh, really appreciate it. By the way, anyone saying no, no, oh God, we've never done it, or we do it, I tell you what most people do, we do it every now and again when we think we haven't sent one out. That's the usual thing. Oh, we've not done that for a while, let's do it. And it never returns in any results. So if that is you, you're basically in line with pretty much everybody else. So you're not alone, basically. Just think on the, the, the questions we've put up here. Do you send referral emails? If so, how often? If so, do they work? And usually the answer is not very often, no. Although, oh yeah, exactly. It's kind of sort of, not very often, not really. They don't really work. No, it's pretty tricky. Um, I love this GIF again. Uh, I'm a huge high five to product director Chris on uh, helping us with the memes here. I've got this amazing product, but I don't ever ask for referrals. And then going, why are sales so low? We're going to go into the psychology of this in a second. But first, I'm going to show you my guess as emails that you may have seen or sent before. Now, uh, I love that, Tamsin. So you should be doing. Very, very pleased. And this is going to be for you, Tamsin. If you are asking happy customers for reviews and case studies, you're going to love this. Not what's on the screen right now. You're going to love what I'm going to show you in a second. So these are the kind of emails that you may have seen before. Uh, these are the kind of emails that you may have seen before. Um, I'm not saying they're good. Bear with me here. Hi, Jane. Thank you for your time earlier this week. I wanted to ask, who do you know that you'd recommend us to? Uh, I mean, in theory, this is quite a good email. It's direct. It's to the point. There's no sort of messing about. It's kind of obvious what you're hoping the result is. Why is it likely to fail? The paradox of choice. It's too open-ended. What you're really doing when you're emailing Jane saying, hey, Jane, you're awesome. Um, who would you refer us to? What you're actually saying to Jane is hugely complicated. You are saying, Jane, I want you to mentally go through your mind Rolodex of every person that you have ever met. And then I want you to think about which of those are teachers, head teachers, SLT, whatever it may be, and then break them off. Then of those, I want you to then think about which ones you know well enough and who you may have spoken to recently that could possibly be interested in our products. And then I want you to tell me who those people are. And I mean, man, life. Hopefully this is starting to make sense as to why this doesn't work. And it's not because Jane doesn't want to help you. It's, this is way too complicated. Even though it's such a simple ask, who do you know you refer us to? Nine times out of 10, I'd say more than that, to be honest, it just doesn't work. You just don't get the, the answers back. Oh yeah, we'll refer you, don't worry. You know, we'll, we'll refer you. 
But what happens is they refer when another school says, oh, I'm looking for such and such a product. And they go, we use these guys and it's awesome. That's how it tends to work. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so option two. You may have also seen this kind of email, the Amazon. Hi, Jane. We're currently offering £20 voucher to any teacher that successfully recommends us to another school. Would this interest you? You wouldn't usually send it after the first one. So I just sort of intoned us wrong. Um, or option three, very similar, the discount. Hi, Jane, we've recently launched a new referral scheme where any school that successfully recommends us to another school will get 20% removed from their invoice next year. With this in mind, who do you know that you recommend us to? Let me explain why, again, you don't need to do either of these things and why this is way over complicating it. So, Firstly, paradox of choice, same issue. Go through everyone you know, segment them, segment them again, segment them again, and then tell us, like, tell me who you're going to refer us to or refer them. But also, crucially, this, and we say teacher, educator, SLT, head, blah, blah, this teacher, Jane, is now no longer sure if she's referring because she wants to or because there's some sort of kickback that she or the school's getting. And it kind of puts them in a little bit of an uncomfortable position there. Um, and now discounts on future licenses as well with the 20% uh, the discount next year, et cetera, can actually sometimes prove really complicated for a school to administer because the person you may be speaking to, maybe a teacher or a head teacher, for instance, but the person signed the checks, maybe someone else and they're budgeting for something different, a 20% reduction next time can actually just be really complicated. And sometimes it's just better just to don't do that. Just leave it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely not needed. Ultimately, the higher the cognitive load, the higher the barrier to action is. We need to just simplify things right down and find a way of just going, I've made it super easy for you to refer us to other people because you love us. And I'm going to show you the big trick on how to do that. This email, just as a bit of a warning, does need a little bit more prep than the other email strategies that we've, we've talked about. The other ones, you know, you could, if you want us to, you could go and blast one of those out this afternoon. This one, you're going to need to do a little bit of, uh, of prep work for it, uh, a little bit. Understand first the psychology. People are four times more likely to buy when referred by a friend. That is why, in one quote, referrals are hugely important. You all know that, you know, schools buy from schools, teachers buy from teachers. Word of mouth is one of the main ways that companies scale or, or make sales anyway. Absolutely. We need to encourage it. How? There's a few things we need to do. We're going to lean in on humility. Important. We've talked about that already as to how. We're going to narrow that audience down. So we get rid of that paradox of choice. And we're going to leave no room for movement. So the steps we need to go through for this. One, identify your flagship or your case study schools. Two, you're then going to set the tone with an email or a case study call. I'm gonna give you a couple of other ways that you could do this in a second. It will make sense when you see the email. Um, but um, Tamsin, think of those schools that you've done a case study with, you've asked for reviews, they've given you some lovely feedback. There at step two, you now move to step three, okay? What you will do is, you'll find five local similar schools. So this is really simple. The school that you just did a case study with, go to Google Maps, put that school address in in Google Maps, put a pin, and then look, type in schools, look for schools that are around that school and just go pop, 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 pop. You'll be able, easily be able to find say four, five, six local schools to that school in most cases. Note them down, note them down, okay? You find those five similar schools. Then you're gonna send this email get anyone's questions, anyone doesn't know stuff, anyone's unsure about things, stick it in the chat and I will clarify. You're going to send this kind of email, all right? Let me just uh, see if we can go to the next screen and show. Okay, so <clears throat> you've made my day, Jane, thank you. Personalized humility subject line. In this context, as you will see, um, Jane has just done a case study. And as part of that case study, we've gone, that is awesome. Would you be happy to, re to refer us to the schools? She's gone, yeah, of course I would. Thank you. She gets an email. You've made my day, Jane. Thanks so much. Uh, emojis in subject lines. And we're not talking about subject lines. We're not meant to. Emojis in subject lines. Not always, but a lot. Do it. Um, okay. Contextual introduction showing grace. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for saying you'd be happy to refer us to the schools. I'm really pleased you're seeing the value in my tech products. Again, just reiterating the reason 
that she said she would be happy to do this. It's not, thanks so much for saying you do it. Thanks so much for saying you do it. I love that you've seen the increase in attainment. I love that you've, you noted that those disengaged boys have started to become engaged. I, reiterate what was said, okay? There's the strength. Now, specific reason for outreach. We're actually looking to expand into more schools across the Northeast. I wonder if you'd glance through the following list and let me know if there are any schools you know well enough, you'd be happy to recommend us to. And now we've limited the choice. These are our uh, five schools from Google Maps that are local to Jane's school. We've simplified, no longer is it, Jane, go and figure out who you're gonna refer us to. It's Jane, we're looking to do this. And which of these schools here, there's limited choice schools, which ones of these do you know well enough that you'd refer us to? This completely changes the conversation because what Jane's now doing, instead of going, who do I know that is like this and is actually a teacher and actually there, I might be in a position where I've spoke to recently and I might be able to, instead of that, Jane's going, St. Christopher's, do I know, I do know Christopher's, I don't know Rockwell, um, I don't know Starlight, I know Bleakwood and I know Tanner House, but actually I really know such and such a school as well and they're not on the list. It's for Jane now, it's a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, which is way easier to understand, but that encourages Jane to go, who else do I know that might be of use to these guys? Many thanks again for your continued support, it means a lot. Closing thanks, but then we're presuming action. We're not saying, you know, if it's too, if it's not too much trouble, if it, don't worry, it totally accept, no. Which of these do you know well enough? Jane could say, I don't know any of them. Let me tell you, that never happens. What happens is they go, I do know that one. I know that one. I don't know the others, but I know this one. And I've also got a head teacher's meeting in a few weeks time that um, I could certainly talk to this about. Have you got any stuff, anything you want to send my way? That is what happens. This is one of the most powerful emails that you can release. And I could be wrong, but I don't think we've ever released information about this email. And uh I could be wrong there, but I don't think I've ever released any information about this email before because this is one of the cards I love keeping up my sleeve, but we had lots of questions about sort of referrals and how do we get it and stuff. So we thought it makes sense to actually push this out to people. This is a hugely, hugely powerful email. So this is my slide for people who didn't take notes. And again, you're gonna get the slide deck and all the rest of it. So just a reminder of the, the three emails that we've talked about there today. We have got the open loop, where uh, we're gonna create anticipation and leave them wanting more. That's gonna encourage people to open and act upon the next email. So the next email better be damn good. We've got the second email, which is the reactivator. So that's for your cold leads. That's gonna bring them back into warm. And then you can maybe get them with an open loop, but that's gonna get people back in by just, I'm just gonna click on something. What's the reason you've not spoken to? Is it A, B or C? You know, That's a really powerful tool to use. Not what's the reason you haven't heard from you? Hey, will you bother to think about this and reply? Instead, it's, I need you to reply. Click on a link. That's cool. Appreciate it. Reactivator email. Really uh, powerful in getting those cold leads to go, who are these guys again? What is it they do? I'm intrigued. Um, by the way, a really, uh, I, I, I'm going to say this because I know not many people will use this, but it's a real cool thing to do. You can segment your list um, to a point where people, uh, we often call them like the buckets. So people who, haven't opened emails for a certain length of time. So that may be, I don't know, they've just not opened an email for <clears throat> three months or they've opened email, they've just not clicked on anything. And I have sent them free lead magnets. I have sent them emails. I've asked them for demo requests. I've asked them for, and they're just not doing anything. You can actually use a reactor of a three email and that, that template that I gave you. But instead of saying, hey, you've not booked a call with those, you know, what's the reason? Would you like this, this, this? One that we've used before is we say, look, we don't want to be spammers and I don't, I, if we're annoying you, like I don't want to be that person. So um, you've got a choice. Like if you never want to hear from us again, like th that's cool. Just do nothing. And this will be the last email that we send, uh, you know, and wish you well and all the rest. Or if, if you're fine hearing from us, it's just not quite the right time to work with us right now. Just, just click here. And that's cool. Really powerful the threat of removing something from someone is incredibly strong. People don't like the fact that, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, I didn't say I didn't want this, I was just not quite ready yet. It's a really good way to start interacting and engage with people again. I know a lot of people won't use this because they'll go, oh no, it seems a little bold and a little scary. Use it to a certain specific number of people. Very, very powerful though. A uh, very, very powerful way of using a reactivated campaign. Email three, the referral machine. Remove the paradox of choice, narrow those options, make it hyper-targeted. You have to do the groundwork for it as well. So like Tamsin, 
Um, this is, uh, I, I, thank you, Tamsin. That is a really lovely comment to read there. Um, my sales team wants to send emails asking for referrals. This clarifies the structure to use. Identify who those referrals are going to be. You don't need to blast it out everywhere. Identify, um, you know, get those case studies in, and then you want to react with them quickly. I said I'd give you some other examples. Okay. We firmly believe that, you know, marketing isn't just the marketing team's job. And that's not because I like to shirk responsibility to other people, but marketing is um, everything about the brand, the way it's positioned, the way it interacts with people. And that's from the moment someone very first hears about it through to dealing with problems and how the company you know, fixes those problems through to the renewals, through to the CEO and everyone, in the, everyone who possibly represents that brand. Think of schools, lots of schools with uniforms like it, when your child is walking home or is on this school trip, whatever, we want them in our uniform and we want them dressed smartly because they're representing us right now. They're not at school, but they're representing the brand. So, um, and you could do this when something of interest happens and you guys should always be thinking. So let's say uh, a, a support call comes in. If you have a support team, someone's got a problem. They go, I just, one of your schools go, this thing's gone. We've lost the data. I don't know what to do. I can't get the thing working. I'm freaking out. Help me. And your support team go, have a brew. Give me five. Done it. It was this. Here's a Loom video. If you've not heard us talk about Loom videos before, you need to check out our previous uh, webinars. And maybe we'll do one on videos and doing, maybe do one on videos, Chris, and do one about um, making good videos and how to. Anyway, um, your support person sends through a, there will be a recording of this session. Um, your support person sends through, don't worry, Jane, here's the answers. Uh, every head teacher is called Jane, apparently. Uh, here's the answer to the thing. We fixed it. Life's good. All happy days. Jane goes, oh my God, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hey, no worries, Jane. Actually, is there any chance we'd grab you for a few seconds just to uh, have a little chat about your experiences over the last year? We'd love to grab a few words. That's how you can get a case study, how you can get um, testimonials done. Something happens, ask them the question. They do the case study, they do the testimonial. That's awesome. Thanks a lot. Actually, based on this, which of these local schools do, would, you, uh, would you refer us to? You could skip that case study section in the context I just gave. Why? Because you gave them a favor. Now, yes, they're paying for your team. and They're paying for the support of your team. But they see this as a favor. You went in, you fixed a problem, you gave them the solution. Oh my God, thank you so much. Reciprocity kicks in. You owe me something because I did this. Which of these schools would you happily refer us to? This one, this one, and this one. That's how you speed up referrals. That's how you grow business rapidly. Um, right, now what, before we hit the AMA? Three things. One, try it. Um, I do not do these webinars just to hear the sound of my own voice. Um, I love nothing more than people dropping me an email going, oh my God, we did this thing and um, you said, and it worked. And that makes, it makes this whole thing worthwhile for us. So you don't need to do everything we've done today and say, there's not actually three strategies. There's probably about 15 strategies in there. Uh, I found it really hard to narrow this down to three, but there are three different types of emails. Just take one. Just take one of those and go, which one of those could I use? And when could I use it? Don't rush it. There's no rush now. Use one, put it out there. And then part B of try it is tell me. Tell me what worked. Tell me what didn't work. Two, if you're interested in working with Be Digital and us sort of doing this kind of stuff for you and growing your, age, your business in that sense, you can book a growth strategy call with me or anyone in the team. Uh, URL is there. Three, if you haven't, I've mentioned before, sign up to the uh, Tate newsletter. If you've not done away, Bean, you must sign up to our newsletter. It's fantastic. Uh, it's a big team effort and it's a wonderful, wonderful newsletter. So there's the three things uh, from there. And I'm going to stop screen sharing so I can look at, actually, I can bring Chris in a little bit, I think. Uh, hey, Brian, can you hear me? I can, Chris. How are you? Okay, very well. Uh, Emma has a question, which mm -hmm. is something we talk about all the time, which is, uh, should we do HTML? Or should we do plain text and emails? And obviously a lot of the templates you showed there were plain text and quite deliberately so. Right, really good question. I want to just draw a distinction between HTML and plain text, excuse me, HTML and plain text emails here. Um, the answer is pretty much always HTML. However, the caveat to that is they often look like they're plain text emails. So if it's just a plain text email, you literally can't put hyperlinks in anything and you can't track anything and you can't do the clicks and all the rest of it. Um, but if, think what, if what we're getting at is like, should it look like a plain text email? Should it, or should it look like, you know, nice big banner, um, sort of marketing-y kind of email? Move away from that. <clears throat> Move away from the big banner marketing emails. There is a place for them. The place for them is very direct sales messages when you're just going, 
here's a thing, here's an update, look how cool it is, your newsletter, or, you know, that's fine. There is no problem in having stuff that's very well designed and looking like a newsletter. For the emails that I've suggested today, they should all look like they are HTML-based emails. And in fact, for um, the last email that we talked about, um, yeah, for the last email we talked about, that would have to be sort of handwritten. You know, you wouldn't really be able to automate. That'd be very, very complicated to do. You would have to handwrite it. And they should all feel like they've been handwritten. And they should all be signed off by a person. It shouldn't be from the EdTech company or, you know, it should be from Brian. Um, but it should definitely feel and look like it's, it's just been written on Outlook or written on Gmail. Dear person, here's the thing, da, 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 done. Um, Emma, can I just ask, does that sort of answer your question? Because uh, I can go into more depth around the differences of those, but uh, yeah, it, it needs to be HTML, to be honest, so that you can put hyperlinks and things in and then track it, but it shouldn't look designed. It should look like you've just got and, and plain text just typed away at it. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, no problem at all, Emma, no problem at all. You'll see that the vast majority of emails that come from us and from our systems and all the rest of it are, and, and that we encourage are exactly the same. Um, and it's beautiful because you don't need to worry about creating headers that are certain sizes and, you know, putting tables and how it looks on desktop and how it looks on phone. Uh, and the reality is these days, so many emails are opened on phone anyway. Something that's really well designed may not look very well, or you may have a huge amount of space before you've got any text and it just looks like a big sales email. You might get reasonable opens with no, in no interaction. The point of this is we're not really that bothered by opens alone. We want to elicit an action. And the best way of doing that is bringing context, uh, a content right up above the fold, so to speak. Um, uh, there, were there any other questions on there at all, Chris? I uh, wasn't able to sort of keep up with the things that's happening on there. Is there anything else that anyone's had? No, no, at this point, um, I think most people have had most things answered. Um, yeah, great webinar, Brian. Super. Well, um, where are we? It's 10 to. If anyone else has any questions, then please feel free to pop them in there. Um, and I'm more than happy to have a little look at that for the next couple of minutes. Um, where are we? Yeah, I'm more than happy to look at that for the next couple of minutes if anyone's got any questions. Um, otherwise, uh, that there are there, that's our webinar. There are three big strategy, hyper, uh, super easy to use, very, uh, very powerful, impactful uh, email strategies. Uh, oh, timing. Oh, timing. That is a question. All right, so there has been often quite the debate about sending emails on Sundays. Um, I remember a little while ago, there was a company, it was a well-being company, or this company that was talking about well-being anyway, and uh, teacher well-being and teacher mental health and all the rest of it, and they sent this big campaign email out on a Sunday. Um, and it didn't go down particularly well, let's put it that way. And you can kind of, I'm not surprised. Um, in terms of Sunday send, it's kind of up to you. I wouldn't want to say either way. It's just you will probably get quite good open rates on Sundays um, as, as teachers open it comes to their, their, their inbox on their phones and the rest of it, and they're thinking about the week ahead. Um, but use it with caution. Um, I wouldn't be doing that particularly often, to be fair. Um, in terms of days and times for the rest of it, honestly, the best answer is it depends and test it. Um, there are so many different... You know, there's so many different times it's good to send to people. You know, sending a teacher an email when they're teaching is probably not going to be that wise. Getting an inbox, uh, an email into a teacher's inbox for, you know, 8.30 in the morning is, is probably better or, you know, 3.34 is probably better or lunchtime. And it tends to be those sorts of times really. It's outside of core teaching hours is, is ideal. Um, I wouldn't be doing them on a Saturday or a Friday night though, personally, unless there's some very, very specific reason to be doing so. I uh, hope that answers the uh, the question there, Kathy. Um, but really, keep an eye on it is basically the uh, the shout. Keep an eye on it. See what's working, what's not. So that's it. Um, I've left the uh, the slide up on the screen there. So if anyone has, uh, you can see the information there. Uh, please feel free just to um, uh, follow the strategy call link if that makes sense. Feel free to uh, join our newsletter if you haven't already. And also, please feel free just to connect with me or to drop us an email uh, with any other questions, anything that you, uh, you you think you'd like us to cover or talk about in a future one. And um, we're a few weeks away, but if I don't speak to any of you, um, anyone that's uh, off and enjoying the, uh, the Christmas break, have a lovely Christmas break, and uh, we will uh, no doubt see you all and speak to you all very soon.
Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.